Welcome everybody to day two of uh, the DNA lectures at Family Tree Live. It great, gives me great pleasure to introduce Laura House, our first speaker of today. Um, how many people in the audience are beginners? Okay, very, very good. Well, you've come to the right place because Laura is a great speaker and she was, you were a beginner yourself not too long ago. So um, over the course of the last five years, Laura has trained herself in the basics of DNA. She knows where beginners are, are coming from and she's going to talk to you about DNA for beginners focusing on the three main tests. So please give a warm welcome to Laura House. Hi, and yes, welcome to DNA for Beginners, the three tests. Uh, like Morris said, my name is Laura House. I'm a genetic genealogist, and I'm currently studying towards an MSc degree at the University of Strathclyde. And for my MSc, I'm specializing in the application of DNA to genealogical research. So what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is how you can use your DNA data and the DNA of your relatives to um, improve your genealogical research and to verify your existing research. Okay, so who here has taken an autosomal DNA test? That would be the family finder at Family Tree DNA. That would be Ancestry DNA. That would be my heritage. That would be 23andMe. Yeah, there's a couple. Not as many as I thought. Okay, cool. Um, so your autosomes are all of your chromosomes except for your sex chromosomes. So you have 22 pairs of autosomes. You get 22 from your father and you get 22 from your mother. So you get exactly 50% of your autosomal DNA from each parent and through them, roughly 25% of your DNA from each of your grandparents and through them, roughly 12.5% of your DNA from each of your great grandparents and so on. So this is the majority of what makes you who you are. And um, if, so if you've had that tested, then that's what you look, if you've had one of those tests, then that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the vast majority of the DNA that you inherited from your two parents. Now, um, the X chromosome, even though it's technically uh, one of the sex chromosomes, if you're biologically female, you'll have two. And if you're biologically male, you'll have one and a Y chromosome. Even though it's one of the sex chromosomes, it's often tested along with the rest of the autosomes. So when you get your autosomal DNA test results, you might see it in a graphic that has all of your autosomes numbered to 22 and then the X at the bottom. So even though it is thrown in there, it is still, um, it's not an autosome, it is a sex chromosome. And then the Y chromosome is the male sex chromosome. So who here has had a Y DNA test? Good, good, couple of people, all right. So um, you can only take the Y-DNA test if you are biologically male, as you said. And the Y-DNA, well, the Y-chromosome is passed almost perfectly intact from father to son for generations and generations and generations along the same line that in this country, at least, we pass down a surname. So the Y-chromosome is very useful for surname studies for this reason, because while we're looking at this line of data, we're also looking at a man and his father and his father's father and his father's father's father and you can use this data to examine the line going back hundreds of years. It's very cool. And then uh, mitochondrial DNA, has anyone here taken that test? Oh, I'm impressed. Okay, yeah, that's for the, if you're really committed, you take the mitochondrial DNA test, that's cool. So um, your mitochondrial DNA, you inherit from your mother, whether you're male or female but only a woman will pass it down to her children. So if you are male, you're carrying your mother's mitochondrial DNA, but you won't give it to your children. If you're female, you will, you'll give it to your children. So um, we use this to trace the direct maternal line because it's passed from mother to daughter, mother to daughter for forever. Um, so when we have that test, that's the line that we're looking at. And as we'll discuss a bit later on, it's not as useful for recent genealogy as the other tests are, but it still has its uses. So we're going to talk first about autosomal DNA and the way it behaves. It recombines randomly during each meiosis event. A meiosis event is the creation of sperm cells and egg cells. So when we create sperm cells and egg cells, we take our DNA, we shuffle it up, and we give a random 50% of our DNA to each cell. We give roughly 25% uh, of each of our parents' DNA to, to that but um, it is 50% of our own DNA. And this is why if you've got two full siblings, they're not identical. 
because they will each have inherited a different 50% of the DNA that you've given them. They've each inherited a different section of that DNA. So they only share 50% of their DNA with each other, whereas identical twins would share all of their DNA. It would all be the same. Because of the way it's shuffled up and passed down, it can potentially be inherited from any ancestor. So this is why autosomal DNA is so useful for genealogy research. Um, if you're looking at any given segment of your DNA, without figuring out who you share it with, you have no way of knowing which of your ancestors you could have got it from. It could have been any of them. So we can use autosomal DNA to verify any line of the family tree. And this is what makes it so useful. It's very, very flexible. Um, the shared segments of autosomal DNA are measured in centimorgans. So if those of you who have taken the test already, you might have noticed that on your match list, it tells you how many centimorgans you share with each of your matches. It's um, quite important that you learn what this number means, because this is the number that tells you how closely you're likely to be related. And that's really important for figuring out the common ancestor, which is the ultimate goal with this. Um, so we're going to talk a bit more about that later as well. You get your uh, ethnicity information on your autosomes as well. So you probably heard, on the adverts at least, that you can take one of these tests and it will tell you that you're like 10% Swiss or 20% Spanish or something like that. And um, that is on the autosomes. And finally, you also get health information on the autosomes. So if you test with 23andMe, for example, you'll get some health information and they've taken that information from your autosomes. Um, and that's another thing we're going to talk a bit more about later. So you're not only faced with the decision of which test to take, you're also faced with the decision of which company to test with. So we're going to look at four of the biggest companies, um, four of the most popular companies in the UK at the moment. Ancestry DNA, Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, and 23andMe, starting with Ancestry DNA. So all of the different companies have different features and different tools and different benefits. So ideally, you want to get into as many of the different databases as you possibly can so that you can exploit all of the exciting benefits. And uh, with Ancestry DNA, it's especially good because, of course, being Ancestry, a lot of your matches will have trees and hopefully well-referenced trees so that you can figure out by looking at their tree which ancestors you share. And again, that, that is what you really want to do. And then when you figure out the ancestors that you share, you know that the DNA that you share with that person came from that ancestor. So then you can say, oh, this, this segment on chromosome two, this came from my great, great, great grandmother. And that's what you want to be able to do. Um, it does have some limitations. Uh, there's no chromosome browser, um, which means that we can't see the segments of DNA that we share with our matches mapped onto our chromosomes. So if we do share DNA with someone, we have no way of knowing on this website whether we share it on chromosome 3 or chromosome 5. And um, we can't see it, and we can't. Therefore, we can't see if three of us all share the same DNA segment on the same chromosome. So that's a bit of a limitation. And you can't transfer your data to Ancestry for free, whereas you can with some of the other companies. And I'll talk you through that in just a sec. So Family Tree DNA is another great company. And um, you get your matches, you get your ethnicity results. Uh, this is where you can test your Y chromosome and your mitochondria as well. And um, you do get the chromosome browser with these guys. So that's fantastic. You can see the DNA that you share with your relatives. And um, also, they accept free transfers. So if you were to test with Ancestry and then download your data from Ancestry, you can upload it to Family Tree DNA and you can get all those new matches and see who you match in that database. And you can do that for free, although there is a fee for full tools and full features. And MyHeritage is um, an interesting one because they started up a bit later with their DNA than the others. And they seem to be advertising in Europe quite a bit. And I've noticed that I've got a lot of my European matches from MyHeritage. So if you have any European heritage, might be worth thinking about going into the MyHeritage database. You get the ethnicity results, you get the chromosome browser, um, and they have some great tools as well that they've just introduced um, that I don't have time to talk about today, but that I would love to. Um, and what else? Yes, they accept free transfers as well. So if you test with Ancestry, you can move it to Family Tree DNA and to MyHeritage 
for free, but once again, a fee for the full features. But that's the cheapest way of doing it. 23andMe um, is very American, so a lot of your matches in this database are likely to be American and therefore probably quite distant. Family Tree DNA and MyHeritage also have quite a lot of American matches. Um, as, uh, if you're British, you're most likely to get your closest matches in the Ancestry DNA database. Um, 23andMe is interesting because as well as getting the matches and the ethnicity results and the chromosome browser, you also get health information. So it will tell you if you carry markers for certain conditions. Although I must say that if you do get something flagged up that you're worried about, definitely go to a doctor and get a second opinion because it's, it's just an algorithm and you do want to follow that up. You don't want to panic if you take a test with them and it tells you something a bit scary. Um, a lot of people take the 23andMe test who aren't interested in genealogy because they're just going for the health. So that's a shame. But also a lot of people take the test because they're interested in genealogy and not in the health. Wait, did I say that the first time? Did I say that twice? No? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, because they're interested in genealogy but not in health. But health results can be useful for your genealogical research. And I'll give you a short example. My great-great-grandmother, she was Irish, and she had a lot of babies who died. And the family story was that she was a negligent mother and that she'd failed her children. This is what was told to us by our family, that she'd um, let her children down, that she'd gone out partying and that she hadn't looked after the children properly and that the children had died as a result of her neglect. When we tested my grandfather's DNA, we found that he carried a marker for um, a condition called Tay-Sachs disease. And Tay-Sachs disease is a condition that's prevalent in um, Irish populations. And what it does is if a child has two copies of this gene, the child will die before it is two years old. It will just waste away and there's nothing you can do about it. And on the death certificates of these babies, the cause of death was atrophy, which is exactly what Tay-Sachs does. So after all these years, we thought that this woman had been failing her children when in reality she was living through some kind of awful nightmare. And we would never have known that if we hadn't done the health test. We would never have known that this gene was in our family. And this is one way of learning more about the stories of our ancestors, is to get as much information as we possibly can. So it's sad, but it's very interesting. Um, OK, so we're going to look at it. We're going to use a small example here using my own family to show you guys how you can verify your genealogical research using DNA data. Because it's not just about expanding your tree. It's also about confirming that your current research is correct. So here we've got uh, some of my ancestors. This is, uh, that's my dad at the bottom there. And then my granddad. I would be using my pointer right now, but I can't because I'm back here. So you're going to have to figure it out. Uh, that's my great granddad. And then my great great granddad, Louis Raphael. And then my great 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 granddad, Carl. And my great 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 grandmother, Gabrielle. And my great 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 grandmother, Maria. And she was born, Maria, in 1756. So we want to see how far back we can get verifying our lineage using autosomal DNA. Um, there was no picture of Louis Raphael. So I drew that myself, by the way. It's very good, some of my finest work. So my dad is still around, luckily, so he can take an autosomal DNA test as well. It's always worth testing the oldest generation that you can, because they have the highest resolution of your family's DNA. So whereas I only have 50% of my dad's DNA, he has 100% of his DNA, that's even better, and he has twice as much of his parents' DNA as I have. He has twice as much of my granddad's DNA as I have. So always test the oldest people you possibly can in your family. It's worth doing. Um, so I test my dad and of course the first thing I want to verify is that I'm actually related to him. Because uh, you can never take that for granted. Never. And you'd be surprised how many people get a shock. So uh, the first thing I want to see is that we share DNA. So I test him. I also test my mum. And this is what it looks like when you match your parents. These are your uh, 22 autosomes plus the X chromosome, two for me. And um, when you match somebody on the chromosome browser and family tree DNA, it colors it in blue. So blue is the DNA that we share. And as you can see, we share it all. So that's fantastic. So today we're just looking at my share with my dad. Great news. I match my dad. He is my dad. We're super happy with that. That's the first hurdle. 
So um, I put my results in the, all the DNA databases, and in Family Tree DNA, I get a match with a guy called Anton, and we share 28 centimorgans. I look at his family tree, and I see that he is descended from a different son of my great-great-great-great-grandmother, Gabrielle. So that guy who's not circled, that's my ancestor, Carl, and that guy who is circled, that's Anton's ancestor, Louis. So, in theory, we are fourth cousins once removed, according to documentary evidence. But we want to know now if the amount of DNA that we share is consistent with a fourth cousin once removed relationship. Because if it's not, then that's a bit concerning. So we go to the Shared Centre Morgan Project, which is a fantastic website. I absolutely recommend it. And it tells you, you can put in the amount of, uh, the number of centre Morgans that you share with a relative, and it spits out some relationship probabilities. So you can see what the most likely relationship is between you and this person. And this is so important. When I talked earlier about understanding what certain amounts of centre Morgans meant, this is what I was talking about. You want to know this. So um, it's given me all these different probabilities, uh, possibilities, uh, sixth cousins, sixth cousins once removed, fifth cousins, blah, 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 blah. And we are supposed to be fourth cousins once removed. And that's 55% probability. That's one of the highest ones. So that's good. That's supporting evidence that we are both descended from Gabrielle. And if that is true, then that entire lineage has been verified all the way back to her, because we would not share DNA if we weren't both descended from Gabrielle. But because it's so far back, we can't just use me and Anton. We can't just rely on this single, sense, this sing single segment because we need as much data as we can to feel confident in our conclusions. Um, so I compare everyone else in my family to Anton. My dad shares the same segment. That's a really good sign. My cousin Rhiannon takes a DNA test as well, and she shares a different, uh, a different segment, a bigger segment, at 43 centimorgans. So although it's not the same segment, this is great. This is additional data. We want as much data as we can, proving that Anton and our side of the family are all related, and that therefore we are definitely descended from Gabrielle, and that research is definitely correct, and nobody has had any affairs, and there's no illegitimacies. We want to make sure that that's the case. My aunt Sharon, on a different line, takes a DNA test as well, and she shares the same segment that Rhiannon shares, plus an extra one. More data. Fantastic. And then, more data from the other side of the family, from Anton's side of the family. His half-sister, Sophie, agrees to take a DNA test so that we can add to our pool of data, because it's great to have data from as many sides as you possibly can. The first thing we do is we compare Sophie and Anton to make sure that they are actually half-siblings. They're supposed to be half-siblings. So we compare them to make sure that that's correct. And yes, this is exactly what you would expect to see from a half-sibling relationship. A lot of DNA shared, but not as much as full siblings. So that's great. That's sound. Sophie and my dad share that segment of chromosome 8. That's fantastic. And then Sophie and Sharon, my aunt, share a segment on chromosome 17. And we get to triangulate now. So triangulation is when you can get three people who all share the same segment of DNA. And this makes us much more confident in our conclusions. So ideally, what you want is to have as many different relatives as possible, all sharing the same segment of DNA, all descended from the same common ancestor. And this makes you feel much more confident that your research is correct, that this DNA really does belong to that ancestor, that you really did inherit it that way. And with Auntie Sharon and my cousin Rhiannon, both sharing the same segment on chromosome 18 with Anton, this is very, very compelling. So we're feeling good about me being related to my granddad now. That's great. And my great granddad. And Louis Raphael. And Carl. And Gabriella. So we've gone back that far. And Gabriella was born at home, and it's very unlikely that there was any sort of baby swap incident. So we're feeling pretty good about Maria too. But I would like to have additional data that show, demonstrates that I inherited DNA from Maria as well, ideally. So we've been able to go back all the way to 1756. We've been able to verify that entire lineage all the way back to 1756 using autosomal DNA. And then what we do then, once we're absolutely certain 
that a certain segment of DNA comes from a specific ancestor, we map it onto our chromosomes so that we can see which bits of us came from which ancestors. And then you have a sense of, oh, this, this ancestor contributed so much of who I am, and this other ancestor contributed even more, and sometimes it's an ancestor you never had any interest in, and you suddenly discover that you inherited tons of your DNA from this person, and they, they're integral to who you are. So that's my segment from Carl, that, that green bit there. That's from Carl, I'm confident about that now. So I've mapped that, and here are some segments I've mapped to some of my, from some of my other ancestors. This is the DNA I inherited from my great-grandmother, Annie. My other great-grandmother, Annie, 234. And my other great-grandmother, Maria, I think I've mapped all the segments that she gave me by testing all of my mum's cousins from, who are descended from her. So this is how you go about this. And what you eventually end up with is something of a genetic jigsaw so that you can say, this is how much I inherited from this ancestor. This is how much I inherited from this other one. Maybe some ancestors you haven't inherited anything from. That's how it works. And it's a bit like a Sudoku puzzle as well. Because if you find that you have a segment from one branch that you've mapped, and then you get a segment from another branch, and they overlap, and they shouldn't, this means that a mistake has been made at some point. So you're going to want to revisit that and uh, figure out what went wrong. Um, I just want to say as well, if any of this is a bit dense, don't worry. If it's the first time you're hearing it, that is normal for it to feel a bit... Uh, um, just let it wash over you. And then the second time you hear it, it won't feel so difficult. It won't. Um, so the advantages of autosomal DNA testing are that it's not limited by biological sex. That's a big one. Anyone can take this test, and that's really great. And this also means that you can use it to verify a lineage of any kind, whether it's man, woman, man, woman, man, or all men or all women, it doesn't matter. You're not caged in with autosomal DNA. You can potentially verify any lineage in your family tree using autosomal DNA. You're not limited. You can go to any ancestor and attempt to find cousins who you share with that ancestor. You're both descended from this person, and you take a DNA test, and if you share DNA, that's a really good indicator that you're definitely descended from that ancestor, and you just keep adding to your data. It's especially useful in unknown parentage cases. So if you're somebody um, who doesn't know who your father is, or you're an adoptee, autosomal DNA is fantastic for figuring out who your father is. It's a complex process, but it's one that can be learned. Um, and it's great because you can see how closely related you are to your matches in the database. So if you've got a half sibling in the database that you don't recognize, that's a good sign that you're onto something in terms of tracing your father. Or if you've got a first cousin that you don't rec recognize the same, you're onto a good thing. Um, the databases are much bigger for autosomal DNA than for the other types of DNA because it's such a popular test. People love it. People get it for Christmas, and people want their ethnicity results a lot of the time. Sometimes they just want their health results. So it's incredibly popular, and you've got a very good chance of finding some genealogically useful matches in one of those databases. And uh, it is the most affordable of all the tests. And Ancestry DNA sometimes comes down to 55 pounds. I think it might be that at the moment here. I'm not sure about that. I haven't checked, but I think it might be. So it gets incredibly cheap, um, and I think it's absolutely brilliant value for money. And of course, you can do the transfer. You can test with one company and then move your data across to the others to get as many matches as possible. It has limitations as well. In order to figure out which bits of your DNA come from which ancestors, you are relying on the assistance of your cousins to a certain extent. You're relying on them either having a public tree or being willing to share family history information with you. And sometimes you're relying on them being willing to share their DNA information with you as well. Um, and it can get complicated trying to get three people who share the same segment. Sometimes it can be a bit of a, a, bit of a juggling act. And it is possible to carry zero autosomal DNA from distant ancestors when you get back to a certain point because of the way the DNA is shuffled up and passed down and broken in half each time. When you get back to a certain point, there will be some ancestors in that generation who you share quite a lot of DNA with, and some ancestors who you share no DNA with. So you might be interested in a specific ancestor, and you might keep chasing and chasing, trying to find segments that you inherited from that ancestor, and it's never going to happen because you didn't inherit anything from them. And this is why we test our immediate family as well, because you might not have inherited anything, but if your first cousin did, then that's enough 
to verify that line. You don't have to have the segment. Someone else in your family could have the segment. Um, it's also possible to share zero autosomal DNA with a third cousin, which is quite close. I'm sure a lot of you guys know some of your third cousins. You probably met them on Ancestry and you exchange loads of messages and maybe some letters and stuff and you're really close with them. And then you take a DNA test and you don't share any DNA. And that, that would be really, really disappointing. Um, but it does happen because when you get to a certain distance, again, because of the way it's shuffled, you can end up not sharing DNA with certain relatives. Um, and of course, that goes for any relative more distant than a third cousin as well. And it doesn't necessarily mean that one of you has a mistake in your tree or that there's an illegitimacy in one of your lineages. It doesn't necessarily mean that. So don't panic if you don't share DNA with your third cousins. Um, when you're dealing with very historic lineages, you need lots and lots of triangulation. So if you're testing your dad, you don't need any triangulation. If you want to know you're related to your dad, you just need to look at yourself and your dad, and you can see straight away, oh, I've got 50% of my DNA from this person. There's no question there. But when you go further back in time, it's not enough just to say, oh, I share 28 centimorgans with Anton. That means I'm descended from Gabrielle. You can't do that. You need more people. You need more data. You need as much data as you can possibly get your hands on, or you can't soundly say that you have proven that lineage completely. And do, 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 do. oh yeah, <laughs> which brings us to the last point. It is really expensive to be thorough. Um, if you're going to be approaching cousins to take DNA tests to help you with your project, you're probably going to have to offer to pay because you want to really increase your chances of getting a positive. You want them to say yes. <laughs> when, you offer, when you say to them, I really need your DNA for my project, you want them to say, yeah, of course. And if you want them to say that, you're going to have to say, I'll pay for it for you. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't trouble yourself. And then that builds up really fast and quickly you realize you've spent thousands and thousands of pounds on DNA kits and yeah, you're bankrupt or whatever. So yeah, it's expensive to do it properly. Um, so that's autosomal DNA. And now we're going to talk a bit about the Y chromosome, which as we discussed before, is passed from father to son almost, per sorry, passed from father to son almost perfectly intact for generations and generations. So for the Y chromosome, we're going to be looking at my direct paternal line. So similar people, but all men this time. We've got my dad, my granddad, my great-granddad. We've got great-great-granddad Louis Raphael, great-great-great-granddad Carl, great-great-great-great-granddad Joseph, and great-great-great-great-great-granddad Franz. So um, Franz would have passed his Y chromosome to Joseph, who passed it to Carl, who passed it to Louis Raphael, and so on, all the way down to my dad, who passed it to his sons. And that is the path that the Y chromosome takes. Now, as I said before, my father's still around, so he takes the Y chromosome. If he, uh, he takes the Y chromosome test. If you are biologically female and you want to look at your direct male line, you will need to test a brother with whom you share a father, or your father himself, or your father's brother, or a cousin who is descended from your paternal grandfather down the male line. It has to be somebody who will have inherited that chromosome, so it has to be someone of direct male line descent from one of your paternal ancestors. Um, so if you're biologically female, this can turn into a bit of a challenge, because once again, you're relying on other people being generous with their DNA in order for you to verify your research. But my dad agrees to take a Y-DNA test. And one of the reasons I'm particularly interested in this line is because my great-granddad, Frederick, he changed his surname from Harris to Vediger, uh, from Vediger to Harris during the First World War because he didn't want to have a German surname while he was serving for the UK in the war. And, um, but there's no documentary evidence of that. So I've always felt a little bit uncomfortable. There's, he just suddenly changes. He just suddenly changes from one to the other. They've got the same birthday. But apart from that, I'm feeling a little bit shaky about them being the same guy. So I'd really like some Y-DNA evidence to support the fact that the Vedigas and the Harrises are the same people, the same family. Of course, we do have the autosomal DNA evidence to support that but we want Y as well. This is what your Y-DNA data will look like if you take the Y-DNA test. It's not as pretty as autosomal DNA data. Uh, it's not presented in as attractive of a graphic, but it's a more practical and in some ways easier to understand. So along the top there, you've got your markers, and then beneath that, you've got the value. And the value is what's important. Um, this value should stay rough, these values should stay roughly the same as they're passed down through the generations. But every now and again, 
one will mutate. So if you look at that uh, 28 on the end, if you can see that, that could turn to 29 when it's passed down to the next generation, or it could change to 27 when it's passed down to the next generation. And some markers are more likely to, to change value than others. And this is how we measure relatedness on the Y chromosome. We look at how many differences there are between two sets of values. Um, so this is what my dad's looks like, and what I really want is to get a Vediger set of data that matches this perfectly. Unfortunately, uh, Carl does not have any direct male line descendants apart from the Harrises, so he's no good. Joseph, um, his lines have all dotted out, which is a horrible expression that we use to mean that there are no living Y chromosome bearers today because someone screwed up and had a daughter at some point and the Y chromosome got lost. So my only hope now is Franz. The problem is Franz uh, lived in the 1700s in Germany. And if I'm going to trace a direct male line descendant of him, I'm going to have to go to Germany and do that. So I haven't gotten around to it yet. So I don't have a match. I don't have a Vediger harris match. But one day I will. One day I will trace a direct male line descendant of Franz, and I will get a match. And this is the dream, that I will have a Harris set of data and a Vediger set of data that match perfectly. And that's how you know that two men are related on the direct paternal line when their Y-DNA data matches. And it does tell you that on the website as well. You're not expected to compare it in the two tables. It will tell you how closely related two men are on the Y chromosome when you look at your list of matches. So the advantages of Y uh, DNA testing are that you can potentially verify a lineage spanning hundreds of years. So whereas the autosomal DNA gets shuffled up and split in half in each generation and potentially eventually you don't have any DNA from certain ancestors, that doesn't happen with the Y. The Y is useful going back generations and generations and generations because it mutates so occasionally that if you match someone with a distance of three, there's a good chance that you might be able to figure out who that ancestor is. And it might be hundreds of years ago, but there's still a good chance that you might be able to figure out who, which ancestor you share on the paternal line. And then you've verified a line that goes back hundreds of years. Um, it can also uncover surnames of unknown patrilineal ancestors. So, um, for example, uh, if you know that there's been an illegitimacy or an adoption at some point in your direct paternal line, and you know that there's an interruption in the surname, and you take a Y-DNA test, and you see that a lot of your close matches have the same surname, that's a good indicator that that is the surname of the ancestor that you're trying to trace. But, and uh, useful in unknown paternity cases for the same reason. Because if you, if you are biologically male, and you don't know your father's name, and you take a Y-DNA test, and you have a whole load of really close matches, all with the same surname, it's not proof, but it is a strong indicator that that is the name of your father, the surname of your father. So it's useful in paternity cases for that reason. And um, because of the way the data is inherited and because it doesn't get split up and mixed up, it's very, very accurate and reliable. So if you match someone on the Y chromosome perfectly, you can feel pretty confident that you share a direct paternal line ancestor at some point. You can feel pretty good about that, and you know exactly which line it's on as well. You're not worried that it's going to turn out actually to be somewhere else. It's definitely on the paternal line. The limitations of Y-DNA testing, uh, like we discussed before, it can only be taken by someone biologically male. So if you do not have a male relative who carries your paternal Y chromosome, then that's a shame, and you might have to look further out. You might have to look at more distant cousins in order to get your hands on that Y chromosome data. Um, obviously, only one lineage can be examined at a time because it's passed down one line straight. So um, you're not uh, likely to, well, you're definitely not going to make any unexpected discoveries about a different branch of your family tree. You're only going to learn about that one branch at one time. In some ways, that makes it easier and simpler, but it's also you're caged in in that way. Um, and you can't gauge a close relationship with precision because you can match someone perfectly on the Y chromosome and they could be your dad, they could be your brother, your first cousin, your second cousin, they could even be your third cousin. All you know is that they're reasonably close on that line, but you don't know for sure how close. So you would then need to ask them to take an autosomal DNA test to figure out exactly what your relationship is. And, of course, the database is smaller because it's not as exciting of a test, so it's not gifted so much. People aren't so, 
yeah, they're not so likely. <laughs> they're not so likely to gift it, yeah. So the databases are smaller. Um, of course, only 50% of the population can take it. So when you take this test, there is a risk that you're not going to get any useful matches at all. You might have to wait for some good ones to show up. And it's more expensive than autosomal DNA testing as well. So you, again, you're forking out a lot of money um, if you're testing a lot of your relatives. So we're going to have to quickly run through mitochondrial DNA now um, because I'm, not, I'm running out of time. Um, so that is, as we discussed before, passed down the direct maternal line, mother to children, mother to children, mother to children. This is my direct maternal line. There's mummy and my grandma and my great-grandma, and then my great-great-grandmother Mercedes, my great-great-great-grandmother Maria. So the mitochondrial DNA has been passed down, down this line, and of course to me as well. And the way that we um, are presented with our mitochondrial DNA data, there's something called the Reconstructed Sapiens Reference Sequence, which was created using the data of um, some modern day humans and some ancient hominids to create a sort of uh, standard mitochondrial DNA haplotype. And when we take the mitochondrial DNA test, we're looking at how we differ from that standard. So the way that we measure what our mitochondria looks like is in terms of how it differs from this reconstructed sequence. And so these are, this is our family data. This is how we differ in different regions. And what you would be looking for if you were testing a relative who you should share a direct maternal line ancestor with is that you would both differ in the same way. You both differ from this standard sequence in the same way. So I've got this fourth cousin descended from my great-great-great-grandmother Maria from a different ancestor to Mercedes. And we don't share any autosomal DNA, but what we can do is we can get some supporting evidence that we are related through this ancestor by seeing if our mitochondria matches. And she takes the test, and the data is completely identical. And so what you can do with the mitochondria is you can't draw firm conclusions. You can't say that this proves anything, because it mutates so slowly that when you match someone perfectly, it's only telling you that you're related within the last 700 or so years. But you can say, well, this doesn't disprove that we're related. And that's great, because as scientists, we're just as interested in disproving a hypothesis as we are in proving it. So if you think you've got a maternal ancestor, you, you've got a good feeling that this woman is your maternal ancestor, and you trace a descendant of her, and you get that woman to test her mitochondrial DNA, and you don't match, that's disproved that relationship. So even though you can't talk about proof, you can talk about having disproved it. So because of that match between me and that relative, that whole line has at least been supported, if not completely proven. The data is supporting that research. So mitochondrial DNA, in a way, is uh, the least useful of the tests. And I don't think I've got time for this bit, because it's five minutes. I'm going to skip that. That's just haplogroups. You can email me about that. Uh, so the advantages of mitochondrial DNA testing are um, that you can get supporting evidence for a lineage spanning thousands of years because of how slowly it mutates, but it is only supporting evidence. Um, it can be used to disprove a matrilineal connection, like we just discussed. And of course, as we all know, matrilineal genealogy can be challenging because of the surname changing in every generation. It can be a bit difficult. And any data that can support us in that search is great and help, very helpful. In terms of limitations, I talked a minute ago about how it mutates incredibly slowly, so you can match someone perfectly, and that's only telling you that you're related in the last thousand years or so. Um, it cannot be used as proof of a recent relationship. It can only be used as supporting evidence. And getting the highest resolution test is extremely expensive, and of course it's a bigger gamble than the other tests because the data is a little bit less useful for your recent research. And because it's so expensive and not as useful, the database is much smaller. So that makes it even more of a gamble as well. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Sorry I've been a bit poorly today. <laughs> Please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we have a few uh, mo minutes for, for questions. So um, thank you for a wonderful lecture. I, I was particularly taken by the fact that uh, how much you emphasized that DNA can actually help ratify the research that you've already done. And it's not something that a lot of people talk about, but I think it's very, very important for all of us who have spent decades, perhaps, researching our family trees to get that additional confirmation that the research is actually correct. 
Um, so, so that was a very, very useful um, uh, demonstration. And I think, how easy do you find it to use triangulated segments? Because they are a very important aspect of this type of proof. How easy do I find it to use it? I find it difficult to get triangulated segments for very distant cousins. Um, I find it quite easy to use it if, if everyone matches on the same segment and the documentary evidence is solid, then that to me is really good evidence that all the research there is correct. Um, I also have the advantage of my family tree being very diverse. So it's extremely unlikely that I will be related to any given person more than once. And that really helps as well. If you live in a community where there's a lot of intermarriage, you might find that you struggle a lot with um, identifying segments as having come from certain ancestors. And how many people have second connections in their family trees? How many have cousins marrying cousins? So it, it's, it's very common, really, yeah, for true. those who have ancestors who come from a small, yeah. isolated, rural community, like Ireland, for example. Yeah. So I've got lots of second connections, yeah. connections in my family tree. Um, how many people do you normally get in a triangulated segment? Is it normally just the three people, or can you get four or five? I try and what's get as many as I possibly can. And what's the most you've got um, in a tri one triangulated segment? One triangulated segment... Maybe four, actually. Yeah. Right, okay. It's, I, I am looking at my whole tree all the time. Yeah. So it's, I'm getting data for everyone as fast as I can. But with autosomal DNA testing, the, the work is never done. You've never completely proven it. You can never say, this is it, I'm putting this to bed, it's over. You're always collecting more data. You're always getting as much data as you can. And maybe one day you'll realize that you actually made a mistake. But that's good. You want to know that you made a mistake. So keep gathering data. It's never done. The work is never done. Cool. Questions for Laura. Yeah, we have a question down here. Thank you. Can you recommend any courses or books for learning more? Um, the books by Blaine Bettinger are brilliant for learning more. There's a book um, for when you get a bit more advanced that's just come out that I just got for my birthday. It's, uh, oh, Morris, what's it called? Uh, advanced, advanced Genetic Genealogy. Yeah. And Blaine's book is called The DNA... Uh, DNA guide and Michelle, can you remember? It's 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 the best-selling book on Amazon <laughs> about genetic genealogy. So um, someone look but, it up quick. But, <laughs> but, but, yeah, Michelle's looking it up as we speak. But Blaine Bettinger's book that came out about two years ago now and it's very very good. So um, Michelle, the Family Tree Guide. Yeah. To DNA testing yeah. and, genealogy, and genetic genealogy. Very the Family good. Tree Guide for DNA Testing and Genetic Genealogy and by Blaine Bettinger. And in terms of courses as well, um, the course that I'm on at the University of Strathclyde it is postgraduate, um, so it's a big commitment, but it's fantastic. And they also do some smaller courses, and they do smaller courses that focus specifically on DNA as well. So check out University of Strathclyde. Other questions? Do you have any questions for the audience, Laura? Um, did it make sense? <laughs> I'm a bit delirious because I'm poorly, so I don't know if it, I, I might have just been talking nonsense the whole time. I'll never know. I have listened to a lot of lectures, and I thought yours was very clear and Thank a lot you. of clarity. And I think you summarized things in a very simple and easy un to understand way. That's so very kind congratulations of you, for that. Thank you. Big round of applause for Laura House. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Dan.